Last time on Through the Bible, God appeared to Solomon in a dream, asking him to make a request that God would answer. Well, today our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, tells us about Solomon's wonderful answer and why it pleased God. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'm so glad that you've hopped aboard the Bible bus for another great adventure in God's Word. Now, in just a minute, Dr. McGee is going to mention his notes and outlines for First and Second Kings that includes a helpful chronological table. If you want to download your free copy of these notes right now, you can do that by visiting our resources section at ttb.org and look for our digital book, Briefing the Bible, which contains all of Dr. McGee's notes and outlines for every book of the Bible. Or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE and we'll mail an abridged paperback version out to you. Now, before we get started, Greg and I have just enough time to share some good news about our home groups in India. Yeah, Steve, um, we talk about these a lot, and some of our daily faithful listeners might say, boy, you guys are always talking about these. And there's a couple reasons. One is some wonderful things are happening. God is doing wonderful things. The other is, on a recent program, we read a letter from a lady that said she started listening a year and a half ago. Yeah. And I love that. It reminds me that not everybody who hears each day's program yeah. is a true daily listener. And so it's important that we share what God is doing through these home groups. Why don't you explain the basic concept and where where does it exist for yeah us? well first of all it really came from our one of our ministry partners yeah. in india That's originally right. the idea it wasn't from the two of us, no, in wasn't this us. Room. <laughs> we're not that smart yeah. yeah and the idea was to have an a you know a, a shortened version of dr me instead of the whole five-year series have kind of a core for people to get started with the intent of leading them into the full five-year series and have them come together listen to the program for that specific passage and then have a small group discussion yeah, about yeah. it and lead that. And it has been so successful and there have been so many small groups and people have been able to invite their friends and neighbors. I mean, in the past, I remember when, you know, a, a guy would be excited about through the Bible and he would be at a 4 a.m. bus stop and he'd crank a yes. loudspeaker yeah. above the bus yeah. stop and play through the Bible. Yeah. Well, that's one way to yeah. do it, but it's probably a little more effective to get people into your home, get them reading the word of God themselves and discussing yeah. and doing it based around relationship. Yeah, and, and we now have over 20,000 documented groups in countries like India, uh, Nepal, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. Hard, hard places. Yeah. And But as always, we want to get to some great responses. So why don't you read this first one from Munawar? Okay, this is uh, Munawar. <laughs> I listened to the Word of God with full attention. I had a bad habit of lying, even without any reason. I used to lie. One day, when I was meditating on the Word of God, I realized that it is the worst habit in my life. That's conviction that right is, there coming yeah. through. The Holy Spirit enlightened me and helped me to confess and quit this filthy habit. I have quit my lying habit because the Word says, do not lie, and Satan is a liar. I want to have a strong relationship with my Heavenly Father, not with the liar. <laughs> now I know my identity. Wow. Boy, if you want to know if people are getting Dr. McGee, that's some good theology coming back. Exactly. Now, here's Mrs. Anwar who writes, I have lived my life in fear of uncertainty, sometimes about the future of my children and my family. In my daily devotion, God has blessed me through the life of Noah. He obeyed God's commands, although it sounds foolish when there is no rain and water around you. Hmm. But Noah listened to God's voice and acted upon his command, and with his family he built the ark. When we walk faithfully with God, then mockery of people and even satanic voices cannot shake our faith. God always gives us victory over these uncertainties of our lives. He blesses us with peace and hope. After many years of my life, I have received inner peace through the Word of God. So encouraging. Greg, let me pray for us as we begin our study. Heavenly Father, we ask that your hand of blessing may continue to be on these home groups in India and around the world. I pray that you would bless the ministry now and the program as it goes out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now today, friends, our study brings us into the third chapter of 1 Kings, and we are putting in just about the sixth verse today. And if you have your Bible and we'll turn there, and I trust you have our notes and outlines. And the notes and outlines for First and Second Kings you are going to find extremely helpful. I have in there a chronological chart, a list of the kings of Israel and Judah, those that were contemporary. All of this is important to understand a very significant segment in the life of this nation of Israel, which has for us 
tremendous messages and lessons. All right, now we saw last time the death of David and that his son Solomon comes to the throne. First thing that he did was he married a daughter of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. That was a great mistake. That will be finally his undoing, of course. But he did that. This man brought up in the court of the women, and he was, I would say, a man that was not acquainted with life as his father David was. And I do not believe that Solomon ever had the spiritual capacity for God that David had. You do not find in him that longing for God in his life. But he recognized his shortcomings, and the first thing that he did after he married the daughter of Pharaoh, and you only wish he had done this before, he went to the Lord and asked for wisdom. And it was because the Lord had said to him, you ask what you want, and I'll give it to you. And I think the Lord recognized that Solomon had many deficiencies, he was holy and totally inadequate. But my friend, who is adequate for these things? Who's adequate today for living the Christian life? None of us are. In fact, the matter is, we'll have to come to this later, but did you know that you and I cannot live the Christian life? And furthermore, God never asked us to do it. He asked that he might live it through us. And now he is wanting to do something through Solomon here. And we find that Solomon is permitted to ask for what he wanted. He could have asked for riches. He could ask for power. There are many things he could have asked for. But you'll notice that recognizing his deficiency, this was his request. And I begin reading at verse 6. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David my father great mercy according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Now he recognized that he was attempting to fill not the shoes but the throne of David. And that was no easy task. And he was wholly and totally inadequate. And now, O Lord, my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father. And I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or to come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant. Now here is his request. And it is a marvelous request, by the way. This man recognizing his deficiency, his inadequacy, and unfortunately there's so many folk today that are attempting to serve God that don't seem to recognize their inadequacy. None of us, friends. I do not care who you are and what your talent is. You are wholly inadequate to serve God. And that applies maybe not to you, but it applies to me today. I recognize that. I hope you do. And that puts us in a position where God can help us. Now, here is his request. It's verse 9 of 1 Kings 3, and I'm reading it. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad, for who's able to judge this thy so great a people? Now he's asking for an understanding heart to judge God's people. Now I want to look at that for just a moment. He's praying, we always say Solomon prayed for wisdom. Well, that's certainly true, but what kind of wisdom? He was praying for, shall we call it, political wisdom. That is, the ability to be a statesman, to know how to judge and rule over these people and make great national decisions. But he's not praying for spiritual discernment. 
I think that we need to make that very clear, and I think that you will find in the books that Solomon wrote, Proverbs and the book of Ecclesiastes especially, you find in both of these books wisdom that will guide you down here in this world. And that's the reason the book of Proverbs, such a fine book for young men to be given the book of Proverbs. We'll see that, of course, when we come to that book. But actually, he did not pray for spiritual discernment. And yet, I think you'll find in the Song of Solomon that he reveals a real spiritual discernment. But the thing he's praying for and the thing that God gives him is this type of wisdom. Now, notice verse 10. And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing, and God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast thou asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. You see that? That is it. To make wise decisions. Now, that is today something that very candidly the sickening scene that is before us today in our government is the fact that we've got a group of men clamoring for a position, want to be elected to an office, and all of them are telling us how great they are and what marvelous ability they have and that they are able to solve the problems. Now, friends, by now, some of us older squares, I think we've come to the conclusion that these boys are just kidding us. They don't have the solution. They don't have the wisdom. Oh, if just some of them would come on the scene and say, I don't have the wisdom. I recognize my inadequacy, but I'm going to depend on God to lead me and guide me. May I say to you, it would be so startling I think that it would probably rock the nation. But that's not what we are hearing, as you well know today. Now, Solomon asks for that, and God commends him for it. This was a great step, you see. Now, having asked for this, and God promises now to bless him, not only that, he says in verse 12, Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. Now Solomon does stand out as being a wise ruler. And all you have to do is read the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Friends, you'll find now human wisdom on the highest plane. Now that doesn't mean that it's not inspired. What I'm trying to say is, God, through Solomon, is giving the highest of human wisdom, but he makes it very clear that it's wholly and totally inadequate to meet the issues of life. Now, verse 13, And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. And if thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments, as thy father David did walk, then I lengthen thy days. Now, the standard becomes, as we've indicated before, the standard is David. That's a human standard. It's not very high, but very frankly, very few of the kings ever came up to that. Now we're told Solomon awoke. Behold, it was a dream. He came to Jerusalem, stood before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and offered up burnt offerings. He offered peace offerings, made a feast to all his servants. Now those burnt offerings and peace offerings, as we've said, point to the Lord Jesus Christ. The burnt offering speaks of who he is. Peace offering speaks of the fact he made peace by the blood of his cross. Because of who he is, He's able to bring us into a right relationship with God and that the guilt of our sins may be removed. Now we have a demonstration of the wisdom of Solomon that is given here. And it was a very clever solution to a problem. 
and a real problem. Very briefly, and I'll not read this portion of it, but there were two women, and they were harlots, and they had between them one child. Whose was it? One claimed the child, and the other claimed the child. So they brought this matter to Solomon. Now, how would you solve the problem? How would you find out? Solomon said, well, I don't know who's the mother of this child, but I think that since we don't know and both of you claim it, the thing to do would be just bring me a very sharp sword. We'll cut the baby right in half. One of you will have one half, one the other. Now, the one that was not the mother, who apparently had it in for the other woman, uh, and she had no love, of course, for the baby, she said, sure, go ahead and do that. The real mother said, oh, no, no, don't do that, my child. And Solomon said then, this obviously, the woman that was actually willing to give the child up in order to save its life, that would be the mother of the child. I would say that that was a very fine way of doing it and a very excellent way. Now, this was just one of the many examples that happened during the life of this man, Solomon. Now we continue on in chapter 4 here, and as we move into chapter 4, we see that Solomon now brings the kingdom to its zenith. The thing that marked his kingdom was peace and prosperity. And isn't that interesting? That's what we'd like to have, is it not? And Solomon, I think we could call him a prince of peace, while David was a man of war. But the peace that Solomon enjoyed and those in his kingdom was made by David, the man of war. We today like to feel that God just forgives sin because of the fact he's sentimental and that type of thing. God does not forgive sin on that low plane at all. There's a battle been fought, friends, and there's been a great sacrifice and blood has been shed that you and I might have forgiveness of sins today. He made peace again by the blood of his cross, and it's through that that you and I today can enter into this peace. Now we're told in chapter 4, verse 1, so King Solomon was king over all Israel. And then we have a list of his princes that are mentioned here, and some of them apparently were sons of the sons of David, which would mean they'd be the nephew of Solomon. And I'll not go into that other than in verse 5, and Azariah, the son of Nathan, was over the officers, and he was the king's friend. Apparently, this was a son of David, or else a son of Nathan the prophet. We do know David had a son named after Nathan the prophet. Now, we have here also Solomon, verse 7, had 12 officers over all Israel, which provided victuals for the king and his household. Each man, his month and a year, made provision. Now, this was Solomon's method of taxation, and 12 of them would mean that there was one for each tribe. Now, I drop down to verse 20. Judah and Israel were many as the sand which is by the sea in multitude, eating and drinking and making merry. Now, this was a time of great prosperity. The wars were over. It was a time of peace. And we're told, verse 21, And Solomon reigned over all kingdoms from the river unto the land of the Philistines, under the border of Egypt. They brought presents and served Solomon all the days of his life. Now, this was a great time, and you notice that there was plenty. It was prosperity, there was plenty, there was peace. This was a great time, and this, my friend, is just a little adumbration, a little preview of the kingdom that is coming on this earth, millennial kingdom. This is just a brief period and very brief indeed. Now, in verse 25, will you note this? And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, every man under his vine and under his fig tree, from Dan even to Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. Now, there's several things here that I think are quite wonderful, and we need to note them. It was a time of security and safety. 
that which we do not have in this world today. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. But peace is coming on the earth when the Prince of Peace comes. And in that day, in this day of Solomon, every man dwelt under his own vine and his fig tree. Does that tell you anything? Over against poor or labor, each man, and one's not living in a castle and the other in a hovel, each man has his vine and his fig tree. He has his own possession. And it was from Dan to Beersheba all the days of Solomon. Now we come to one little spot here, and I must call attention to it. And Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. Now the horse was the animal of war, and God had forbidden, if you go back to Deuteronomy 17, 16, you find out God gave a specific law that a king was not to multiply horses and he was not to multiply wives. Solomon did both. When I was at Megiddo, that is, a little mound that overlooks the valley there where we believe that the great issue will be finally settled in the last days. We call it the battle, but it's actually the war of Armageddon in that great valley of Esdraelon. And this place of Megiddo overlooks it. Tremendous view, by the way. But the thing that impressed me were the ruins there of the stalls of Solomon. There are the troughs where the horses ate. All of that is there. Those ruins are all up and down that land. Solomon certainly multiplied horses, contrary to the wisdom of God. Now we're told here something of the wisdom of Solomon. Verse 29, God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much largeness of heart, even as the sand on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the east country. By the way, that's where the wise men came from, from the east, and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than certain wise men are mentioned. And here four wise men are mentioned that were outstanding. Now we are told he spoke 3,000 proverbs. We only have just a few hundred. And his songs were a thousand and five. Believe me, he was a songwriter. And we have only one song that is mentioned. And he spoke of trees. He was a dendrologist. From the cedar tree that's in Lebanon, even unto the hyssop that springeth out of the wall. That's a little humble thing that grows on rocks. He spake also of beasts. He was zoologist. And of fowls and of creeping things. Well, he was a bugologist and a fishes. He was an authority in these particular realms. This apparently the beginning of the sciences. This man Solomon was interested in those things. And there came of all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all kings of the earth which had heard of his wisdom. Now he gained a worldwide reputation for his wisdom. And they came to hear it. Now, we have very few of the Proverbs that he wrote, but it's in the book of Proverbs. And as we've said before, these are extremely helpful to any young man entering life. Certain great principles are put down there that should guide a man in life, guide him in his business. You see, God is very practical with us, and this gets right down to the nitty-gritty where you and I walk in and out of the marts of trade, where you and I go into the bazaars of today, where you and I enter into the courts of the land and into social gatherings. There are certain great principles that are put down there that would guide the young man today. I'm not trying to say he'd be living the Christian life, but he sure would have marvelous guidelines given to him there. We'll have an occasion, of course, to see that later. Now we are going to have to leave off right there today. We'll pick up at chapter 5 and see Solomon as he prepares to build a temple and why we call it David's temple and not Solomon's temple. Until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Why don't you read ahead in 1 Kings 5 for our next great study on the Bible bus? 
For a copy of our reading schedule, you can always get it at ttb.org or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE and ask to be placed on our newsletter mailing list. Well, I'm Steve Schwetz, and as always, I'll see you here next time on the Bible Bus as we travel the highways of God's Word on Through the Bible. Today's study with Dr. J. Vernon McGee is brought to you by Through the Bible, and it's made possible by the generous prayer and financial investments from listeners like you on the Bible bus all around the world.